Welcome to everyone. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to have Theo Dudinger here with us. We are fortunate here to, uh, Greer and I, to be accompanied by faculty members Betsy West and Nadia Anderson. And Nadia has uh, brought uh, some of her wonderful students from two different classes to uh, be in conversation with Theo uh, after his talk. Uh, so I will go ahead and begin with, a, uh, with an introduction for Theo, architect, writer, and designer of cultural studies. Theo Dudinger is founder and head of TD, an office that combines architecture with research, visualization, and conceptual thinking. The scale of the work ranges from global planning and urban master plans to architecture, to graphic and journalistic work. Dudinger created snapshots of globalization, multi-layered illustrations and maps that represent the world in this particular moment. He is also the book, uh, sorry, he's also the author of Handbook of Tyranny, a portrayal of the routine cruelties of the 21st century through a series of detailed non-fictional graphic illustrations. His work is frequently published in various magazines such as Mark, Wired, and Domus. And with that, please join me in welcoming Theo. Thank you, Blaine, for the introduction. Um, just want to lift up my laptop here a bit. I have prepared for today four projects. Uh, one is world exhibition. I mean, I was asked to, yeah, thank you for inviting me. And I was thinking, yeah, what, what, what title would, should we give the lecture? And I thought, oh, let's talk about just what I'm, or what my office is busy at the moment because we have very diverse projects and I think it's just interesting to scroll through them. And I've picked uh, four. I mean, one is an older one, which is the Handbook of Tyranny. So the first one would be World Exhibition, which is an exhibition we prepare for next year, March. Second project would be uh, Handbook of Tyranny, which is a book uh, Blaine mentioned, which was published uh, two years ago. Uh, the third project would be the, with the pandemic space, which uh, is not actually my project, but the project I did with students. Uh, I'm teaching in Germany. And the fourth project would be an architectural project, Film City, which we will see if we, because I prepared quite some slides, we'll see if we uh, get to see it. Uh, before I introduce the first project, I just want to if you introduce you a little bit to my uh, world of thinking or my, my interest. And I'm interested to, to see things uh, which I don't understand. For example, what I'm wondering since I studied um, is this, uh, the, the profession of architecture in, in general, uh, how we got there where we are at the moment um and and how it developed over time so I, we in the office we try to make this timeline of of the evolution of the architect as such and we started with leonardo da vinci which was the renaissance man who incorporated all or so many fields of art in one person so he was a painter a sculptor an engineer an architect uh, a renderer, probably a landscape architect, a theorist, a writer, uh, all in one person. And somehow throughout the, the years, our profession got split in many different fields. So, and uh, you could say it's the, the atomization of the field, but it's also professionalization. At the same, at a certain moment, there was the civil engineer, there was the theorist, the writer, uh, the model maker, uh, the renderer is very popular and, and a late split off. Uh, we have facade designers, um, yeah, and so on and so on. I don't see so. And it, I just, I'm just interested to discover that and to know where we as an office are or we as a profession are in the context of the total. Uh, what I realized by doing that, that I'm, or we are in the office quite, um, let's say, uh, combining 
many or, or, or not many, but, but quite a lot of these fields. So we, we are called, or we are very close to graphic design while we are not you know, graphic designers. We write, we theorize, uh, we make all our models ourselves. Um, also because it's, it's a, a smaller office because we do uh, urban design and architecture and so on. So it's a very diverse field. And it's also a little bit of an, an introduction or maybe even a disclaimer to what you will see in, uh, in my presentation because it's very broad and sometimes not, you would might wonder why would an architect do something like that. But I think, and that's what I, I love about our profession, that it gives us so much freedom to um, incorporate uh, many fields. And I think as long as it's about space, as big or as small it is, it is about architecture. So that brings me to, to the first project I wanted to share with you, which is uh, the World Exhibition. It's not the World Exhibition, you, you might be familiar with it's it's just the exhibition our small exhibition we call world exhibition because it is about the world and we are fascinated about the world or earth as um, as a space uh, this is the exhibition space with the different um, uh, exhibition pieces um, this is the space um, as a, in a picture and this is the first um, the first uh, exhibition piece we will show, it's the timeline of globalization. It's, um, I have to say that the exhibition shows work of the last 15 years we are busy with and uh, 15 years of theorizing earth as an inhabitable space. Um, and, and, and it has, yeah, different, let's say many different, uh, um, thinkings or theories about. So the timeline of globalization tries to, um, you see it in the background, it's a 24 meter long uh, collage, which is here, I mean, here you see the last, it, this is the more detailed version of the timeline of, of globalization. I think here is somewhere 1900. Here we have uh, Hiroshima, so this is 1945. Uh, United Nations founding is also 1945. Then we have going to the moon is 1969. Um, this is 9-11. So this is the last phase of globalization. So the last hundred years. Uh, we made a, a, I made a, a, a shorter version of this timeline. This is the condensed version, which is um, at the same time, the index of all my theoretical world uh, work in that scale. So whenever I do something, it falls somehow, this is somehow the, the index page of it. And it shows the last 500 years of globalization. And it starts with the journey of coming back of Ferdinand Magellan with its journey around the world. And what this moment shows is actually the, uh, the proof that we are living on a sphere. And I'm very much fascinated by this sphere, the space we inhabit, that it's a sphere. So it's not a cube. I mean, I as an architect educated in, in as modern architect, I would immediately make a cube probably, uh, but a cube is not so sophisticated as a sphere. A sphere gives the illusion of eternity, of uh, end, the endless space. So the sphere as an inhabitable space is a, the most fantastic invention and it must be, if, if God is an architect, he's the, uh, uh, yeah, he's really, um, um, how do you call it? The, the architect, because <laughs> it's, it, he's a genius. Because to, to, to design a sphere as in heaven to the space with uh, gravity and all of that is really genius. So that's the fascination here. Magellan brought back the proof the, tr the, 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 the truth or the proof that it, e it is a sphere. And from this point on, we tried to understand this sphere. So we, we measured it, we measured its territory. We established a communication throughout the sphere with starting with the 
telegraph, later telephone. We established trade, global trade, global sports with the, uh, with the Olympics, global architecture with uh, the international style, politics with the United Nations, so with a world uh, or a world parliament, the world style, and pop culture as a world culture, a global culture which spans the whole world. Uh, the red line you see is the speed to uh, travel throughout the space. Uh, it took four, three years for Magellan to uh, travel around the globe. We are now in, um, in the time of, of, of 90 minutes. Yuri Gagarin uh, had the latest record and it's somehow stable um, that if you shoot somebody out with a, rock, a rocket, he, she will land 90 minutes later again. So that's uh, another plateau we reached. But this kind of, um, how do you say, acceleration happened in the last 200 years. This side story here, what you see is the split of the messenger from the message. That happens actually with communication. So with the introduction of the Atlantic cable um, and the, um, let's say, sea the, the, infrastructure, the, 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 yeah, the telegraph or telephone infrastructure, uh, suddenly the voice, or as we experience now, there's almost no delay between me and you. So voice and video are much faster than my body. So if I would travel to Charlotte, it would take, I don't know, eight, nine hours, while my voice and my, my image is already there. So that happened somewhere around, I think, when was it? Uh, 1860, let's say that the split of voice and body happened. And this, all of that is the index and this shows actually what, how the global space um, was treated throughout the last 500 years. And that's the intro to the exhibition. And a very interesting moment in this Timeline is the International Meridian Conference, 1884, where the zero meridian was put through Greenwich and where the, the coordinate system, so the longitude and latitude was introduced. So that's the, also the birth of the GPS system, the global positioning was possible through this agreement and the sphere was caught into a net. So it was a technological layer on the sphere, which allowed us to measure the sphere perfectly. Now, I mean, we have the technology at that time, it was just triangulation, but now we have the technology to measure the space um, yeah, down to, a, to, to millimeters almost. Yeah, I prepared a little uh, video. I think I have to... Um, step out. Just to, I want to show you this uh, video. Do you see my screen? I don't know. Leave me. I want to. I don't know if you see my screen. We don't see it. You don't see it? No. I'll share it. Yes. Now? We saw it for a brief instant. Now? Be alone. Do you see it? No. <laughs> No, okay, uh, fair enough. I could also... Yes. Yeah? Yes. Out Caesar, out Nolus, Emperor of the world.
It's a little bit. Do you see my screen again? Yes. No, you don't. But not your presentation. Not. Not really. Yes. yes. Now you see it again? Yes. Yes. Um, I did show Charlie Chaplin and um, in The Great Dictator to show how, free from the story of the movie, how Earth can become a device, a machine, and how you can play with it. I mean, it's, it's a playful element and also a very sensitive element. I mean, the, the, the piece in itself is very beautiful, how you can fall in love with, with this uh, fascinating sphere and uh, how you have to treat it also and it, it's not a, um, a thing to play with it's a thing to or a device or an element to take care of but still I take the freedom in the exhibition to um, to to show its um, yeah it's it's doings and it's um, yeah its properties, let's say. So this is one um, one um, um, device we show where it's just a, a, a painter's roll. Uh, every um, every rotation is a day. Um, this is Earth in a book, where we slice the Earth um, kind of horizontally along the long uh, long latitudes. Um, where it's actually a merger, merger between an atlas and a globe. So you open the book and with every page you slice uh, Earth a little bit. So it's not a rotational figure, but a, a horizontally sliced figure. Uh, here we have the first examples of, a laser cut, of the laser cut book. So what you saw before was just a dummy. Here's the equator with zero degrees. This is somewhere at 47 degrees where the cut is already very shallow. So these are the continents um, cutting through, through the paper. Uh, one element, I just go quickly through the um, exhibition because we don't have so much time. One element is the ultimate atlas. That was actually the ultimate reason why I was in invited uh, for this exhibition is um, my recent book about um, Yes, it's, it's, it's an atlas about, yeah, the Earth, uh, spaceship Earth, and which shows Earth in a graphical binary code. Um, it has all elements atlases have, so it, has, it talks about the surface, the population, Earth population, energy, military, wealth, nature, and so on. But everything is presented in the binary code, so in zeros and one. Here you see Earth, water, Earth land with uh, a division line. Here you see all apples on the planet in one year. So we have 90 million apples, uh, 90 million tons of apples per year, where they come from. So this is the home country of all of these apples. Uh, trees, for example, I cannot even express that number in English. I think it's 3 trillion of trees. 
uh, where they are, what kind of trees the, uh, they are. Uh, aircraft carriers, for example, so we have 20 aircraft carriers. The United States, I think, have nine. Italy has three, and then Brazil one, China one. I think they have now two, and so on. Um, what is interesting that our desire, it goes back to the, what I explained in the, in the, um, in, in the um, timeline of globalization. We have this ultimate desire to count and measure everything on the planet. So we need to know how many apples, we need to know how many trees there are. And with this knowing, we get a responsibility, especially with trees, for example. If we count again, then there are less trees. So probably we did something wrong. So with every knowledge, we also acquire uh, a certain uh, responsibility. And I think it's not always, we are not always conscious about that. Um, Yes, but it comes with, with knowledge, becomes responsibility. Um, and that's what I like. But I like also this language this book is in and the language we are now dealing with is the zeros and ones. So there is an international global language, which is zeros down to zeros and ones, which doesn't depend on any culture, on any, um, any other thing we know, but every voice, video, anything we actually do online or digitally is broken down to zeros and ones. So there is one general language we are more and more living off. And I also try to um, translate this language into a graphical, uh, into the graphical world. Another piece in the exhibition will be the world as Excel sheet, which is actually this moment of 1885 of the introduction of the zero meridian through Greenwich, which turned uh, our planet into an Excel sheet. So you can, uh, it just depends on, um, on the resolution of this planet. I made a, a globe, uh, and now a, a real 3D element. So this is very rough resolution, but you can imagine if you color in here, blue and green, blue for water and green, you would, get a readable map of the of planet Earth, but just with a very, very rough and fine of uh, rough grained resolution. Google Earth, for example, has exactly the same, but a very high resolution. So it's also just colored pixels, but we can get, we can um, um, apply any information to this Excel sheet. So I think if the, um, the logo or yeah, the logo of industrialization was the gear wheel. I think the logo of ours is, of our times is it, it's the Excel sheet, which dominates more and more our, yeah, our thinking. Global times is also an element in the exhibition which shows the time zones. Uh, I don't wanna elaborate it too much, but my hypothesis is that we, um, that every time zone is also a space so that we leave, don't live on the same planet if you're in a different time zone. So here, all time zones got their own Earth. Uh, you are now in, I don't find it. I think it's hidden here. You're one of these three. Uh, you are here plus three, I think, isn't it? Yeah, plus two or plus three, somewhere here. So we don't, we are not in the same space. In my case, it's dark outside. And I mean, there are also examples where, for example, the, um, the, def, uh, the surrender of, of, the Nazi, of Nazi Germany happened for most of the world uh, on the 8th of March, while for the Russians, it was the 9th because it was already the next day. So they celebrated on a completely different day. Um, so it, it has, um, yeah, and also if you step from one time zone on the other, you, you step from one space, from one uh, yeah, room into the other. This is how we want to show it in the exhibition. And uh, last but not least, I'm fascinated by the speed uh, of the space of Earth. And it has many speeds, but one speed it has in itself built in, it's the uh, rotation around the axis and it's quite fast. So on the, on the equator, it has 
1,500 feet per second as a speed. Uh, we calculated for Charlotte, it's um, 850 miles per hour at the moment. So at the moment you move with that speed or 1,200 feet per second. Uh, here where I'm, 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 it's a little bit slower. I'm at this degree and the North Pole it's zero. So it's fascinating that we actually inhabit such a, a, a piece of infrastructure. If you imagine that it also rotates around the sun, it's a cannonball we are living on, which has its own spin. Um, to just want, we want to show this in, um, in, in the exhibition on, um, we outsource it to the Opera House. The Opera House has a rotation, rotating stage and the stage is, has a diameter of uh, four meter. Um, so we bring actually North Pole to this stage. We fill it with ice and let it rotate 20, in 24 hours uh, one time. Uh, and it's big enough to see it moving. You see it with the naked eye that this rotates. Yeah, so to just, you can visit the North Pole at this exhibition. Yeah, that's a little bit the overview, but also the introduction in the thinking. I see that we don't have so much time, so I have to speed up a little bit. So the Handbook of Tyranny is a two-year-old book, or was released two years ago, which deals very similar thing with very similar things which I explained. So it deals with technology, space, and the human being. So human beings not only try to understand and map and draw. Uh, space, but also try to conquer it. And for conquering and keeping territory, we depend, yeah, design different technologies. These are pre-modern and these are modern uh, technologies. And each technology has a different reach. So here in the ground section, you see actually diff the extreme difference between the pre-modern reach and the modern reach. So it's really, um, yeah, M much more and, and, and so here in, in square kilometers, unfortunately I have to, to I have this, uh, it's also funny that our space is not the same because you are in, in miles and we are in, in kilometers and meters. So even the definition what, um, how we measure space is not unified yet. But you see that for example, here we have almost 40 uh, square, square kilometer, which one person can defend one soldier. So for, I always say that, for example, Monaco, we have very small countries here in Europe. Monaco, you could be defended by an army of one person easily. This person would shoot into France. But it has also immediate impact on, uh, on, on the space and on the political space itself. So this is the pre-modern Africa, which is much more fine-grained because it's also, its technology was, was much uh, less, a head less, uh, mass, um, a smaller reach. And this is um, contemporary uh, Africa. What you see is also not only that it's more uh, roughly grained, but you also see inscribed uh, earth as Excel sheet. You see already a technological space here. I was flying this year uh, over uh, Wisconsin where I saw the Excel sheet myself because the fields were, I, I was completely surprised because I'm always talking Earth as an Excel sheet. And I look out of the plane and I see the Excel sheet because it was also a snowy landscape and you saw the division of the fields, it was just there. And I always thought, okay, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but since I was flying over Wisconsin right now, <laughs> I know I'm quite right. Um, I'm, I'm on to something, um, yes. So these are the, and, and, and what is, I mean, what comes to it, what we see here, of course, we draw these borders and it's our, uh, we define it. And we define also the rules within this space. So this is, uh, these are two definitions. This is actually one definition that you, where you are born, uh, the law is attached to Let's say when you are born into the, into the US, you are US citizen. And all these countries which are shown here have more or less this, this rule. So you're born into, let's say Brazil, you are Brazilian. While in Europe, 
in most of European countries, it's not like that. You are born into your father's or mother's arms. So your citizenship depends on the citizenship of your parents, while in these countries, not like that. So they are different. There are two different rules. And with these two different rules, two different possibilities for a book come, and this book is the passport. And this passport gives you access to different uh, rooms in this palace earth, if you would call it like that. So if you're born into the room of US, uh, if you get the, the passport, it's a key to, uh, let's say 200, no, no, it's a key to 130 or 40 rooms. We have about 203 rooms. Uh, Germany has the key to most of these rooms, 260 rooms. So the palace earth is for Germans the largest. While if you are from uh, Afghanistan, which is here, which is not mentioned, you only have a key to 24 rooms, which are not even adjacent to your room. So it doesn't even help you to escape this room. So the palace or this house you're inhabiting is comparably smaller. So it's just Afghanistan. Well, yeah, I will show you uh, in the in the handbook of tyranny. We showed it uh, as yeah as the, the the world maps in itself. So here you see Germany with 159 countries accessible without a visa application. Uh, US has 157 countries without visa ap application. And this is the, the, the bottom of the whole list with Afghanistan with 22 countries. Here you see it um, yeah, strikingly next to each other where you see also that Afghanistan is completely isolated uh, from its neighbors. So the only, the only infrastructure which, which would you allow to, to escape would be the, the airplane. The other, another chapter in the book is the wall, is uh, are the walls, which then define these lines which we draw uh, on, 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 uh, on the globe. Here are different architectures. Uh, these are the architectures along the US-Mexico uh, border. There are other examples here, for example, one very drastic one, which goes 18 meter underground, which is the border between uh, Gaza and Egypt, I think I cannot read it now, but it uh, should prevent smuggling. That's why it's so deep. So all of these architectures, what is here interesting is that these are designed so by colleagues of us, by engineers. So this is not just, just happened accidentally. These are design pieces which are very well thought of and especially made for these occasions. Uh, another um, chapter in the book is um, how to secure cities from uh, terrorist attacks. There are different possibilities. Most of them should be hidden like uh, in the form of trees or, or rocks or a fountain or flower pots or even a logo in front of the Arsenal Stadium. So there are different um, ways to, 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 to do that. And most of them are made that um, we don't see them so that we don't feel, um, yeah, because if we would see these, we would see that there is a threat, so that we don't experience a possible threat. We did an exhibition at Storefront, and we made a little walk through Lower Manhattan, where we uh, analyzed many of these architectures, which are very present and very frequent in Lower Manhattan. Here you see, for example, uh, flower pots. M many of them are without flowers or trees, like this one, because it, that's not the point. They are just there for preventing uh, vehicle attacks. Um, um, in, in the financial district, it's, it's still after 9-11, most of the things appeared after 9-11, but they're still very brutal to your face. So there's no hiding. These are, you see all the rocks, concrete bollards. Um, while what is interesting in other, I just flip through it very quickly that in other cases, in newer developments like Hudson Yard, um, measurements get already standardized, built in the architecture, the urban design. You see here bollards, 
which this place has no um, experience of terrorist attacks. It's also very far away from all attacks ever happened in New York. It's completely other side of town for, for New York, you could say, of a low, it's very far away from lower Manhattan, but it seems to be a standard repertoire, to, to become a standard repertoire of urban design and architecture. So uh, that was actually the, the, the shocking or surprising thing that it's, it is not because of experience, it is only done because that's how we do it from now on. Um, and the last project I want to show you quickly is uh, a very recent study I did with my students. So for whatever you see now, from now on is not made by me or by my, my office, but by the students. It's about very similar um, things we analyzed in Handbook of Germany. It's about um, the COVID-19 measurements predominantly in Europe. It starts with our behavior. So we wear masks, we wash our hands. It starts very, very simple and very intimate space. It's also about space. Our hands are yeah, forming space. Our, our mouths, very yeah, private spaces are, are um, protected. And then it's about the space between people, uh, which is very uh, ruled very differently. The black like Bulgaria forces people or advises people to keep two and a half meter distance. Oh, yes. That's right, sorry. So how can I read off the alarm? So 10 minutes snoozing. Um, yes, I don't know if the US is, oh, they wrote America. I remember somewhere was America. Is it two meter? America is here, two meter. So Holland, for example, is one and a half meter, where now Austria is one meter, Sweden has nothing. So it's, this space is regulated differently. Then we have other um, regulations in the city, like here, if you buy an ice cream, uh, you have to move away from the ice cream shop 50 meters to consume your ice, so that to, to spread the people, to not have crowds. Uh, in the urban space, um, zebras get, widened uh, parking lots turned into bicycle roads. Um, yeah, one way roads, one way uh, system for pedestrians, even whole streets were closed off. So the urban space changed dramatically. And this is a very nice research about the park situation. So where, how do we regulate it in an area where it's very free and non-regulated? So this is a park in, in Kassel in the city where I'm teaching which has paths three meters and five meters. And it is advised, there is an advice that to keep a distance when you walk uh, behind each other, five meter, if you jog or run, it should be 10 meter. If you cycle, it should be 20 meter. And the students analyzed how to uh, manage this space. Uh, if you keep, if you follow this advice. So this results in a, very nice dance and choreography in this park, which I just really want to show you. Uh, I know we are short on time, but it's a very beautiful um, animation they made. I know what is here, this is still going on. Um, it's not that. Yeah. Where are you? Oh yeah, here you are. Good. <laughs> and Thank you. 
So, uh, thank you for the attention. <laughs> Great. So do you want to take uh, questions now, Theo? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I want, maybe at the end, of what I wanted to show is actually this broad range from scale also. I mean, it was, maybe I had a little bit too sl many slides for a short time, but um, just that, that the, the same thinking can be applied to, or the say, same method of uh, investigation and illustration can be applied to all, to, to all scales as long as space is, um, is the thing. So space, that's a nice element about space that it, yeah, it always can be measured as big as it is or as small as it is. Well, it's, it's especially fascinating to see the pandemic studies uh, by your students uh, as, yeah. as a way, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, hand it over to Nadia. Nadia, if you want to, to talk a little bit about your classes and introduce your students. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think, wow, this is really wonderful. And it was great to see. Um, I heard some, uh, you were interviewed talking about the pandemic work. So it was really good to actually be able to see some of it, the, the choreography. I can imagine, you know, the old dance um, drawings where they would show the step patterns for dances that you could do have a similar kind of drawing for um you know pandemic movements mm -hmm. <laughs> um i really you know the students have prepared some really great questions so i'm going to let them take it away and for you all if maybe you just introduce yourself and say what program you're in and then ask your your questions so i think isabella we were going to start with you yeah Hi, Theo. Um, my name is Isabella, and I'm a fourth year undergrad student. 
Um, so the first question I wanted to ask you was, um, in regards to COVID, you had a whole project assigned because it's a big pivot point on some of the global issues that are happening right now. What are some pivot points that made you want to write a book like the handbook of tyranny? What were some things that maybe affected you in a specific way to talk about certain categories like the prison cells or the wall conditions around the world? Um, what were some, what were some, I guess, like personal reasons why you wanted to write the book? It, yeah, I think it, 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 for example, in the walls, it was the urge for, very often it's the urge for completeness. I thought that it want to see all the walls. Um, and I thought there are, because there are not so many countries in, on the planet, which is interesting. We have 203 countries. Uh, we could have thousands, that would be a lot. But we have 200 is not for a researcher. 200 is, is quite doable. So um, that was the starting point to uh, think about there are walls and there are typologies of walls and that we could organize these typologies just approach it very neutral as a wall because the wall itself yeah is is a neutral element it was pure curiosity how many do we have how are they constructed what is the technology behind it very um very neutral and objective and that was the only urge was actually um in the beginning at the very beginning uh it was this curiosity and also then of course if we found it and did it to the, the necessity to share it with the yeah within our community great um i wonder so we have a couple of questions that have to do specific well with some of the studies of prison and which also involves walls and current issues with respect to um, you know places that could that might or might not fall into those sorts of categories um julia why don't you do the next one okay um i'm julia i'm in the masters in urban design program here um and in your book you say that there's two different philosophies of imprisonment the prison as a place to get rid of people versus the prison as a place that turns inmates into better people um, and that the cell layouts differ accordingly. Um, it has recently been the policy of the United States to detain illegal immigrants in cages at the border to Mexico and separate children from their families. This specific condition doesn't seem to fit neatly within your description of prisons or refugee camps. So I was wondering how would you go about analyzing a condition such as this? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's too, I would have to think about it really. Cause I mean, yeah, it's certainly not the category, uh, it falls certainly not in the category to make it a, a better place, but it's also the question what, uh, what wrongdoing was, there was no wrongdoing. So and if there's no wrongdoing, you cannot apply the thinking of, yeah, of changing a person or, or so that's, yeah, it, it, the, 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 the problem starts with the beginning already. I only know, for example, in Norway, there, they have, there is one prison which is, which is just an island and there are no walls at all. And it's a kind of a, a farm. And the prisoners, they, they are not even prisoners, but they are the inhabitants of this island um they are farming and that's their so it's really and they uh, learn a job um they're working on this farm and then one becomes then a more me mechanic the other is more into fruit trees and the other one is more into i don't know working with wood so there it's very clearly preparing these people for um yeah, sustaining a life outside and then, then after, uh, after the, the time uh, on this island is completely different view. And what, what fascinates me on that example that it 
it even has not even the, the architecture. I mean, the only architecture is the landscape. So one should not probably in that case also forget the island um, aspect, which is also kind of a landscape architect. I mean, it's, it's, it's already ready-made. Um, yes, but I would say in, the, in this example, you said, uh, yeah, it doesn't sound to me. I mean, I would not know now just how to, to research it. Um, what I like to do is if I don't find examples in the present to look into the past. So cages um, have been used for imprisonment probably more often in the past and in different cultures. Um, and why, what did they mean? Um, yeah, what was it? So, so that's, yeah, history is in that regard sometimes very revealing. While I have to say now, if I see that, that the island is also very revealing, like Napoleon, and there's a whole history of placing people on islands um, as an imprisonment. So this architect, yeah, I, now we could go on and on about it, but that's why I think history is very, uh, sometimes very revealing. Great, that makes me think of, of course, Alcatraz. Um, yeah. It's, um, but then the Alcatraz, okay. after it was abandoned as a prison, then there was a group of Native Americans who attempted to move there and claim that land as a, a, a you know, a sort of separate space. Um, mm. I just learned about that. It, it was inc it's an incredibly interesting um, kind of story. So you could show the same physical space of the island inhabited by two different groups. I don't know. My head, I, I, ideas are coming up like one after the other. Yeah, um, yeah so Sid had a, had a slightly different question, but that it's also related to, um, so Sydney, why don't you go ahead with yours? So um, I'm not sure if you're really familiar with the issue here, um, school to prison pipeline. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if it's a uniquely American issue, <laughs> but there is um, the subject of students in low income areas basically being placed on a track that takes them straight from early education straight into the prison system. And there's a lot of elements that play into it, but one of the, um, I think one of the contributing elements that does play into it is the actual physical structure of the way schools are built. Um, it very much mimics a prison system. You've got cement walls, you've got metal furniture, things like that. So it comes off as a very cold sort of distancing structure. Um, and I just wanted to kind of get your perspective, how, from a design perspective and the design process, how would you begin to address that? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's anyway a very striking difference between Europe and Africa that uh, <laughs> America, the US system, that uh, in Europe you just walk into schools. There are no metal detect detectors. There's, yeah, also universities. You don't have any um, hindrance to go to walk into these buildings. So you don't have a, a card to swipe. Um, so the whole, how you call it, the entrance system or so is, is already very different. And that, that makes it, yeah, but I, I totally could understand that this forms this, um, let's say the school interior as, as this high security space, which almost, as you say, almost mimics a, a prison because you have to go through a guard and you have to go through metal detectors and all of that does something to people, of course. Um, how to get rid of that? I don't know. I mean, in uh, what plane, what me, what surprised me in um, Minneapolis, there were, it was quite open everything. 
There were no metal detectors. There was no card to swipe. Is this? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our university campuses are like that. Uh, although we do have swipeable access after hours, uh, but K through 12 schools aren't often like that. They're they're much more highly controlled. Yeah. yeah. That's grade yeah. school, high school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah but wondering. maybe one could start with a, with a different kind of, of school architecture. I mean, I, I know in the 70s, there were these, uh, for example, in Holland, there were these open schools with, where pupils were educated outside uh, the, the, the school building in the, in, the, yeah, in the gardens and so. It would fit, of course, now to our COVID uh, measurements. To, to double up to say, you know, we, we, if we could educate outside freely, it's more healthy, but it's also without uh, all this architecture, maybe architecture in, uh, at, at large is there a burden? Yeah. Yeah, it makes me wonder if, I don't know, a comparative study, rather than saying, we're going to look at all prisons and look at all schools, but look at all things that are made with concrete and, me and metal or something like that, you know, have a different, as a different basis of comparison. That, yeah. That's too general, but um, yeah. But still, no, but still, I think to analyze school typologies according to their, um, Let's say that would be an interesting thing to see if, if one could uh, make a prison cell typology study and a school typology study and see where they, where you almost can overlay them, where you almost don't see it, it's just a black and white um, ground section study where, they, where you see the schools which are farthest away from prisons in their complete layout and where they complete match, where you cannot distinguish. They would be very beautiful, probably, to just do that. Yeah. Great. That could be an incredible research project, Sydney. Yeah. I think it could be really <laughs> telling. It could open up all kinds of interesting possibilities. There might be the same firms designing these places, for example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You can change your class, what you want to do for your class project if you want. <laughs> Um, so finally, uh, Brie had some really insightful thoughts specifically related to the pandemic and, um, you know, how, whether or not, what the impacts are of the pandemic, I think, on our spatial experiences. But I'll let Brie, why don't you go ahead? Hello, Theo. I'm Brie. Um, I'm an M40 student. And my question was specifically about the pandemic. And when we design spaces, um, architecture usually is designed for the idealized normal person. Um, and humanities differences are usually disregarded um, in the creation of these spaces. And I was curious to see what your thoughts were about um, how this these like new items that we're having to carry around. So for example, everybody is wearing a face mask. Um, we're carrying around hand sanitizer. Some people wear gloves um, and we all have to stand six feet apart. Um, do you think that these characteristics or actions um, have an equalizing effect and how can we learn to continue to strive to include human differences in the spaces that we create? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quite a question. Um, yes, I think. I mean, there is new behavioral behavior is 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 is, is appearing like, like the, the how do you, how each other. I'm fascinated by that by all these, um, yeah, ways how to to greet each other, and for me certainly the Japanese of bowing your head makes much more sense than it ever did. 
I always thought, why are they standing so far from each other and always do these? But now I think, yeah, I always have almost have this to feeling this the same, like to do the same. Uh, that's one. I'm I'm surprised that the face mask is still so dull sometimes that it's not cooler. Um, yeah, I mean, come on, it could there could be much more to it. Um, but yeah, it's still very, very practical, functional. It's not hidden in a, yeah, in, in something. It's very, what, what, people, what we see, I realized with the handbook of tyranny, the older, the older the, the measurements are, the more they become incorporated in design and fashion. Like what, what I showed in lower Manhattan in financial districts, these uh, concrete blocks and, and these visible things, they mostly disappear quite, quite soon and are replaced by flower pots, which look much, yeah, then we design some flower pots, they do the same job, but they look already a little bit nicer. So, and I think with face masks and gloves, yeah, um they look now very brutal maybe but if it goes longer then they turn more into into something fashionable also with gloves i mean if i if you look back 100 years men and women mostly had gloves men had these black leather gloves and women the the white gloves if you, yeah and and disappeared completely but maybe it was it had a, a, a function back then. Yeah. But it's very for, are you, you an architect? I'm sorry, me? Yeah. No. I mean, architecture <laughs> student. <laughs> architecture <laughs> student. I was an architect. Am, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I regard every architecture student already architect. No, but I just think about the. Um, implicate the architectural in the, 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 the bigger spatial implications. Um, yeah, what, what I see, just to, to finish the, the long answer, what I see, for example, now we have an, a design where we have quite a big terrace and balconies all around the building. I can sell that now much better than before. I can say, you know, in times of Corona, this is functional space. Um, it is, somehow also intentionally planned like that, but outside space as in what I said with schools becomes more and more, um, yeah, um, gains importance. It's very, I mean, historically one can very much look back to the tuberculosis in the modern modernity, where also the flat roof terraces were, uh, Blamed by, um, yeah, working against two problems. Fantastic. Um, well, I think we're probably getting uh, close to time. Um, there is one, I think we're going to wrap up this one question in the chat um, where that's asking about in your work, what is about the, and this might not be the easiest question to answer, but what would you say is the proportion between research and design? And that might speak to do, how do you, do you differentiate, what is research and what is design and what is their relationship? Or maybe it's all the same thing. Yeah, it's, it, it little bit parallel research and design. I mean, also research is research. Oh no, we lost him. <laughs> Here he comes. There you are. Go ahead. We just lost you at the beginning to answer the Nadia's question about research and design. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I would say I mean, part of research and design, I think it's, it just goes hand in hand. Um, because the research is sometimes a little bit uh, overrated as a, as a, as a, yeah, as a profession. Uh, but for example, architects, 
uh, if you think about a facade or, or building, we, we do many studies on facade, facade or, or material. Should it be from wood, steel? That's already research. Um, which material should we take? Uh, which flooring should we take? Which tiles? If so, endless amount of tiles, then you have to investigate in the, in the, in the tiles, which is research, I would say, um, especially in, in, in terms of architecture, when you even have to develop new tiles or design new tiles, um, then you have to research into ceramics, um, um, ceiling material, and so on and so on. So I think there is a lot of research in the architectural world, which is not so regarded as research, but still is an old tradition of research. So, and now we look maybe too much into this number crunching research um, and just say that's research. But I, I would say research is a big, big part of architecture and it's very difficult to draw a line between research and design. It goes hand in hand. Um, yeah. We yeah, have one last question, and it's a very direct one um, and easy to answer. We have several people in the chat who are interested in um, the publication of your work on the pandemic study. I want to know if that's something that's going to happen. Yes, it's on, on the way. It will be published published by the Castle University Press. And we are now um, in the last moments of yeah, designing it. And it should go to press, I think, in, the, in, in a few weeks. It will be, it has 260 pages, something like that. And it's a print-on-demand book. The reason for that is that uh, also that the uh, our research could be soon, very soon outdated. So we are very much into the whole thing. Of course, what we did is from, I think it's July, 2020, but it's too early to make, to make real, but the, the, I mean, the, the book is, is, is fantastic and, and the research is fantastic. But we have to stay that we do the print on demand that we could, if there are major changes, we could change the print also to be, to be flexible. Well, Theo, we're, we're super excited to see that. So uh, we'll, we'll be in touch and please, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, be happy to share the information when the book is ready. Cool. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for spending time with us. You've given a lot uh, to inspire us and uh, shown us a lot about how to analyze uh, uh, spatial elements, uh, physical elements, even temporal elements that define our reality that we may not necessarily uh, pay attention to, uh, but should. Uh, and of course, there are so many cultural uh, and behavioral implications of these boundaries, these borders and, and kind of elements and how we design our environment that we should pay more attention to uh, because they're significant. And I really appreciate your work. And, and I wanna thank Nadia and your wonderful students for uh, being with us as well and everyone for your participation. Uh, and I hope, hope all of you have a great studio and a great weekend. Thank you too, uh, it was a pleasure. Goodbye. Okay.